on our set committee, which is outstanding. His daughter goes there, and his son used to go there, and his wife teaches there, and friend of the school. Um, but it just, and Mrs. Powers was there last year, and I just wonder how, and when I asked the administration, they said they were appointed to go to those set committees. I was thinking when I was running for office that if I were to get the seat two, that my that I would represent schools in my district, which would be Chris River Schools. And I just was wondering, uh, of course you I know the custom is not to answer these questions at this time, but I was just curious on why that is taken away from the person that represents our schools, or that there's an appointment, or how those are even determined. Yeah, I can answer that for you because I'm the newest one on the board. Okay. Um, and I probably thought the same thing when I was coming in in 16. Um, but our, and we're just assigned to, to various schools, but the board represents the entire county, not just districts. Okay. So um, we can sometimes ask for a school. They've all been assigned, and sometimes we have switched schools between us. Uh, but each, each of us is assigned to four or five different schools different levels, um, and we, we go. So if, if uh, teachers, administrators, business people, community want you know, something for a Crystal River school, or see a need or something, do they go to the SAC committee and the person that's appointed there, or, just, or should we go to our seat? The board members are, are there just strictly as advisory, we're not voting members of the SAC committee, we're there for advice. Mr. Garlick, they are the, the SAC themselves or the school advisory councils are in statute. It's actually formed in statute and the duties and responsibilities of each SAC are determined in statute, as well as how um, teachers elect teachers, parents elect parents. The school board, um, as well as the district, are ad hoc members, as it was discussed, and so we are, um, the superintendent selects them from the district and then the school board, it's the chair that um, in our policy mm -hmm. actually sets that, but it's usually done in conjunction with conversation with one another. And then the, the one thing that I think that, that you, uh, you talked about is maybe who to have those conversations with, um, because as Ms. Counts talked about, we are, we are elected at large, and statutorily and constitutionally, we must serve at large. We are not to serve our district, we are to serve the entire county. We are only elected based on a geographical area, and that's actually in statute. That's what's got me confused. Yeah, you're right. only, you must serve within a domicile of your area as far as how that is, but you must, you actually must make your decisions govern based on the at-large of the entire county. And that, that is what is sometimes missed. Yeah, it's missed by me and I'm sure other people. So other why? Absolutely. The domicile laws are set in statute as well. Okay. And I think it also specifies that elementary students cannot vote, but middle and high school students can vote. Yeah. I think middle school is optional. I know Trish Taylor's here and she was off the SAC. And, you know, I, I really I want to see our SAC councils continue to grow and build. Oh, absolutely. More involvement, more parent involvement. I mean, this is critical. Mm -hmm. And um, so I appreciate you coming up here and, and you know, talking a little bit about SAC and the importance of SAC. Very, very important. For us in public education, we want the public to be aware and know what we're doing. And, and if, you know, if there's an opportunity for charter schools to come in and take uh, tax dollars into that program, I mean, you know, we want to market our schools. We want competitive schools. We've got competitive schools. We want to keep it that way. 
and we want parents in the community to know that. Okay. And Zach is a big part of that in my view. Mark, just because the elementary students can't vote, they're very verbal. Yes, they are. <laughs> they are. So we know exactly what they're thinking. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And okay. they always have their voice. Right. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And then I have another green card for you. Good afternoon. I come before you to request approval of the Citrus County 2020 to 22 School Health Services Plan. I've asked Ms. Humbaugh to come and just share a few updates um, with you to the plan. Madam Chair, um, I did have a point of order. Uh, we kind of got too got a little bit heavy, but if you don't mind, could I address that with the board? Yes. On, a, on a, maybe a point of order or a customary procedure. I mean, is that all right before before they start? Um, you know, it is interesting, and I, I guess I hadn't really caught this before, um, but, you know, we have citizen comments for anything on the agenda, and that includes anything on the consent agenda, right? right. And when we approve the adoption of the agenda, um, you know, that is what we need to do to start business. Yeah. But then when we don't take citizen comments and we approve the consent agenda, yes. all right, then if someone were to come before the board with an important item that would cause one of us to say, hey, I want to pull that off the consent agenda because this is a valid concern, which we have the right we to do. We have done that before. Right, and, 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 and we could, but if we don't know the comments bef before we approve the consent agenda, then in this case, it could not be serving our public the way we should. So I'm, I'm wondering if it's, if, it's, uh, out of if it's out of order, should we take citizen comments prior to approving the consent agenda. I, I think the problem we might have there, and I'll have to check with this brand new book we just got on statutes, so Ms. Bradshaw, my, we can't, the reason that we propose the consent agenda is the agenda belongs to our superintendent until we approve it. And once we approve it as a school board, then it becomes our agenda. And so we have to approve it first before we can do any business. You approve the agenda, and then, like what Mr. Dodd said, then if you want to do your citizen comment between the approval of the agenda, the approval of the agenda, and then the adoption of the consent agenda, in case someone says, "I've got something on the consent agenda," right? Because yeah, we could, we could do that. The citizens' comments could come between um, the yeah. agenda and the consent agenda. Yeah. That's okay. yeah. I, I think that would be excellent point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other than that, we're just, we're just one on one Just one, two, and three in general. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. 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 So this is comments, and then, yeah, and then if someone were to bring up something that we all had put on the consent agenda, we hadn't, we hadn't approved it until back to the comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Mr. Garland, you were very gracious <laughs> to speak on this document. And I, I, you know, sometimes when we're sitting up here, we don't realize that there is that confusion out there. So I, I appreciate you coming. You know, we've just recorded a lot of information for people that didn't know, especially for parents and people like that, that we want to participate. Um, help plan? Good afternoon, school board members. We have the health services, student health services plan, school health services plan. And that was pulled from consent because of some um, questions. Would you like me to um, address those now, Mr. Dodd, what you and I spoke about? Okay. So in your plan, um, one of the things that Mr. Dodd brought to my attention is um, on page nine, and this is under the, um, the part one, which are just the basic health services. Um, number 10 the, is like the subtitle, which is meeting emergency health needs. And really throughout this section, through the, the various um, like subtopics that you see in that second column, are addressing emergency situations um, 
maybe life-threatened situations, illnesses, etc. that we need to be cognizant of in the schools and in after-school activities, etc. And what Mr. Dodd brought to my attention and to Ms. Bodle's attention is the fact that there isn't anything in here on um, the Zachary Martin Act, which is from House Bill 7011 that um, talks about you know, heat-related um, illness and um, dangers and all of that. Um, I did look through the, um, our policies. We do have a current policy that's 4.88 on um, exertional heat illness. Um, however, Mr. Dodd feels like that the Zachary Martin Act, because of the specifics of requiring the, you know, the school staff who do activities after school, that they are, you know, aware and monitoring heat, um, heat-related maybe accidents or in, in this case with Zachary Martin fatalities. Um, so anyway, that was the first. You did ask about a, a sub-topic, so to speak, which is like 10 D E F, and the health department or the Department of Health gives us this template. Um, which that you see in the second column. So I looked through, or, or Ms. Bodle and I did, and I thought, um, or we thought, it could very well fit into either the 10C, the 10E, or the 10F, where it could be written in where we put in information about the Zachary Martin Act that the schools, you know, that would be approved that we would, um, that the schools would follow along, you know, it would become part of our our requirements. Do you, I, I do, agree with that. I, okay. I think part of that requirement too was for CPR certification too, right? For those uh, coaches, right? Not right. only with CPR. Right. So CPR yeah, I find I find you should reference it in there. It's that I mean that's a very important topic. So I. Yeah, it, it has the, um, the AEDs, the heat stress monitoring, hydration and cooling zones, um, and then um, medical evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then we have that in another spot about the CPR, about the training that is given for that. So what is your suggestion on that? Where would you like to see it? Where would fit best? I... I believe that I put down um, 10, 10C, assist in the planning and training of staff responsible for emergency situations. It's right at the very bottom of page nine. And that's where the piece is in, um, where it talks about the, re the mandated training annually for, um, well, on this it says staff working in clinics, but that could be um, expanded to the, you know, the athletics, all of that, and then put in the um, Zachary Martin Act. I, I, I think there's just, there's various places. Um, 10E talks about the school principal shall assure that first aid supplies, emergency equipment and facilities are maintained. It possibly could go there. Or 10F, all injuries and episodes of sudden illness referred for emergency health treatment. But that talks more about the documentation of reporting that to the principal and and or designee. And if you, I mean, I guess 10G, that does deal with FHSAA. Uh, I don't know. If or it could go there, yes. Included in that, maybe mm -hmm. it could all be together with the AEDs. I mean. And I think, I guess that would, would be something we could check on. I know that little section specifically speaks about AEDs. Okay. Um,
I'll let Ms. Bogle address that. Um, are you addressing for like RHRA staff or for the general public? Those within the school system wanted to learn more about it. So. Uh, well, we do um, student specific training for any employees that are have a diabetic student or you know a student with epilepsy um, anytime a teacher or staff member would like further education the nurses are always available we don't do formal classes except for our hras and our backup hras and, uh, one teacher wanted some more information on uh, like seizure child mm -hmm. seizures all the time so all of us absolutely were told about it all of us mm -hmm. uh, learned how to work with the seizures and i thought that was really good but i noticed you can't think of yourself as an expert, that you might do more harm than good, you know, but having knowledge of it would be good. Um, anytime the staff would like additional classes, we'd like to do them. We just need to know what classes they would like more education on and time. Maybe that'd be a good question to put out to the teachers mm -hmm. and ask them. Absolutely. And just for clarification, because I, I, I agree with putting it into the plan, but these are things we've already been doing in practice, even I think before legislation, um, particularly from you know the cold water baths, the uh, you know the monitoring of, of the, uh, the wet bubble testing. Wet bubble hold. Thank you. I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, as, and the other aspects of, mm -hmm. of this particular program. So I'm I'm grateful for that. But I, I agree. I think it's probably going to be in next year's template. We ought to just add it now, and just, you know, so that's high level. Okay, and, and that is, I mean, we can do that. We can go ahead and put it in there. We don't have to wait yeah, yeah. until it, it's um, put in their, um, in their column um, in, well, it'll be 2023. And um, there, did you want to talk about anything else, Mr. Dodd? Uh, was there uh, that one correction? That oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. On page, it was on page 15, and I couldn't remember if you wanted to talk about that or not. Uh, I don't um, know, has, it, has it been corrected? The, the it, I, I couldn't correct this now because it had already been um, sent. I talked to Dr. Hebert about it, but it will be removed from there. What it was is on number 25. Um, it talks about medical marijuana, about if students have a, a prescription and they have to have medical marijuana, their parents are the ones that have to administer that. And somehow the lines got messed up. And if you look all the way over to the right, it talks about an inhaler. So Mr. Dodd said, I don't think that we want them inhaling marijuana. <laughs> so um, that needs to be fixed. So that will be, that will be changed to policy 5.622, which is the medical marijuana policy. And then the one underneath it will be the 5.62 and 5.621 that um, involves with uh, is involved with uh, students being able to uh, carry their inhalers. So yes, that will be corrected. But like I said, it, it this was already submitted. So when we come back with the added verbiage for the Zachary Martin Act, we can um, you will see it on there that it's been corrected. Okay. So. We're not going to approve this today with the corrections. You'd rather bring it back to us. Okay, that's fine. I, I would yeah. believe that that's what, I thought that's what you all wanted. Yes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Next on our agenda is Dr. Weaver. to table the um, school health services plan for 2020 to 2022 uh, until... What? You want it at, you want it at the next regular meeting or back at a special, at a special meeting? We'll do it workshop. It doesn't matter to me. Chairman, I'll chair aside. You have it ready by the end of this month? Yeah. Okay. 22 weeks? The 27th. The 27th. The table is the October 27th. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a motion to table that um, health, school health services plan uh, until October 27th, special meeting. Secondly, I have a motion by Mr. Dodd and second by Mrs. Bryant to table the 
2022. Uh, School of Public Service was planned for Sister County until uh, our next special meeting on October 27th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, good afternoon. I'm here um, for Mrs. Krause. She is our committee chairperson that um, handles our 21-22 school calendar. Um, so I'm going to go over the presentation and then this is to gather input from you all as she prepares and goes through the process of the 2021-22 um, school calendar. And you, you all should have a copy of that um, in front of you. So as you can see, this is the district calendar committee. Um, that meets, and I know Mrs. Crowell is setting that up virtually. Mrs. Counts is on that committee um, for this representing the school board, and you can see there's a variety of different um, folks that are represented on that committee, from um, teachers to um, administrators to school board members and, and uh, community members as well. And then the timeline, you can see where we are in the timeline. We are at number four, which is the chairperson will seek input from the superintendent of the school board today. And then um, you can see further down the rest of the process, um, which I know you're all familiar with the process. Uh, <coughs> they'll develop some calendars, and then those will be brought back to you all. But today is really to, to gather input from you all. So some things to consider um, that I need to lift out is the testing windows in the last day of school. Um, there's a four-week assessment window that opens no earlier than May 1st um, each year. The two-week assessment window opens no earlier than April 1st each year. And you can see the statute that's listed. I'm not going to read that to you, but that's the st statute that's listed there regarding that. The school start date, all four of the schools cannot start earlier than August 10th per statute. Um, August 10th, 2021 is a Tuesday. So when we're thinking about next year's calendar, it is, it is on a Tuesday. Final exams in the high schools, they are administered at the end of each semester. Um, Mrs. Crowd did find out when the county fair was, because I know that that was a um, situation this past year, although they didn't have the county fair, but it would have been a situation. Um, but she did confirm with Mr. Porter on the date, and it is March 21st through the 27th. And then professional development days, um, either full or half-time days. So the board recommendations are what she calls the non-negotiables for all calendar options. Um, and again, understand whatever non-negotiables we make or whatever pieces you want in would need to be in for all the calendars selected. So when Ms. Crow meets with the committee, she would say, these are things we must do and we must have in place. So I'm going to do an example. If you say we want teachers to have or staff to have a week off of Thanksgiving, that every calendar would have the full week of Thanksgiving vacation, and we wouldn't have school that week. She would put that in there. But understand, every calendar would have that. So you have to decide, do you want to leave that as an option to say, well, we know that one of them might have it, but they all don't need to have it. But I want to be very clear, whatever recommendation she, she, you all provide to her, she will then put in with the committee and make it for all the calendars. Why couldn't we also go make a recommendation that it has that one of the calendars has something we could do that as well uh, that, just because i'm saying i, I understand right. what you're saying as far as the all but i didn't right. think it excluded but you us. could say right and you could say but oh, we'd like to see a variety of options of maybe a three-day week or a five-day whatever you want them to decide we'll just make sure that that's noted yeah not to say something being on the board year and on the calendar committee for the last couple of years we will we will adhere to everything that you consider input. Uh, but if you want different calendars presented to you, then you have to give the calendar committee some flexibility. Yes. And, and I don't disagree with that. I just think though, if if you if you don't give some parameters to say we'd like to at least see a calendar that has X, then the problem is you may not get any calendars. And I've been here when that's happened where we didn't get any calendars then that had what we needed, and that was where the non-negotiables came in, was to say, if you don't give some parameters to have one of the calendars reflect that, then it doesn't become, it can, it can come to us where it doesn't have that option. Well, this particular example, usually the full week also includes hurricane day makeups. Uh, so we want to be real careful when we say something like, 
that's right. an entire week off because we can't use it for hurricane days then either. Well, I think that that's come up in, in the calendar vote is we've taken that language off at times too yeah. for that. So just be aware, whatever you want to recommend, we'll, we'll list and I will share with Mrs. Crow. I believe she may be watching um, if she's available to do that right now. Um, but we will gather that information so when she begins to meet. But let me go through what we have currently. We have Veterans Day as a holiday for students and staff. I know that's very important, especially here in Mrs. Powers at the beginning, that you know we do support our veterans and would want to, to honor that and, and have that off. Hurricane makeup days, the calendar states, days out of school due to holidays may be affected by possible hurricane makeup days throughout the year. So that would be something that would be on all of the calendars. Um, support staff beginning before the student's first day. So having the support staff the opportunity to come in ahead of the, student, ahead of the uh, student's first day. Student's first day not being on a Friday. Now we know this year um, the first day for students is on a Tuesday, but you'd have to decide when you want um, that, I mean, that's not really an issue this year because the first day is the 10th, unless you have a different start date, which you could do. Yeah, you could push it back, you just can't push it again. Right, we can't go earlier, but if you want to start on Wednesday, but I know you don't want it to be on a Friday. And then accommodate for scheduling guidelines for spring testing, so I think just being cognizant of that. And then the next piece is, should the committee continue having this as an on negotiable and all calendar options? And so she's listed the three items and then other feedback you would like to provide. Align the Citrus County Fair with spring break. So that's something for you all to have a discussion. Instructional staff pre-planning days. Do you want that at seven days? Do you want it varied? What would you prefer? But if you want it all the same, then we need to know all of them should have seven days or it could be a varied number. And then end to semester one before Christmas break. And again, that would be something that, are we gonna say that for all of them? or do you want to have varied um, semester breaks? And we can do that as well. So if you'd like to have the discussion and then. I will tell you, the calendar committee takes their job very, very seriously. Okay. And, and we, do, um, we do listen to the non-negotiables. Um, and like last year's calendar, although it didn't occur, um, gave us, I think, two or three options. The other thinking, though, on that was one: you still have dual enrollment students, yeah. even when you don't have, um, and especially that does impact the seniors and, and the juniors. And that's primarily for our high school. But, but you can't have different calendars. That's why that, that's why it's still dictated. It. And then the other issue is: do we really want kids having to come back and take finals? Was another issue after this, the Christmas break. Right. And that was that was another, you know, conversation. The other issue that has come up, and you know, Ms. Powers and, and Ms. Bryant, you've I think been here during that, is if we didn't have two weeks off, a solid two weeks off between Christmas, you know, I mean, the Christmas break through, boy, that was a tough one too, where people were like, well, what do you mean there's only 10 days off? And so, I mean, that that's one, you, you know, it doesn't have to be, but it, it, it does become difficult. I think that aligning it to the, the county fair, it you know, unless we're going to say we are just not, we're just gonna leave that open to staff to make that recommendation, in the past we've not, in the past we've committed to that. So unless we're gonna change that thinking, that that becomes a conversation. And I will tell you, only because it was a, a topic of deep discussion last, last time, um, I asked some of the ag teachers around the county, secondary, um, middle school and high school, and I'm gonna tell you right now, it doesn't matter when you give them a break, whether it lines or not, those kids are gonna take the animals to the fair and they'll make up their work if they, if they don't have school off. 
whether they got a spring break or not. But they, they said it didn't matter to them uh, whether we aligned it with FAIR or not. I was surprised. I really was. But doesn't it impact then it impacts the, the teachers, the teachers and the instructional time, though, that they have if the students are out or if we're having to find coverage? Yeah. So, thank you. <clears throat> I feel strongly about ending this semester before Christmas. I like to end the semester <clears throat> before we leave for Christmas break. I would too. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. It's educational sales. I think the county fair is a you know you, as, as long as one of them has that as an option. <laughs> yeah. I hate to say that we have to decide now between liking. County fair in A, but everything else in B. I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry. so are you are you saying you just want one count, or do you want them all to be with the county fair alignment of the spring break? Well, I think we're still kind of talking about that. Right. Still, okay, yeah, I just yeah. same thing goes with Thanksgiving. Is, is yeah, that what I you're think. saying, Mr. Kennedy? I mean, yeah, that one's not on there this year. That's not even on. Here. But yeah. you can add. You can. Right. This is your opportunity yeah. to tell me. Now, when you add these non-negotiables, that's something that. But there's nothing that says so we can't instruct them to have one calendar with that option. There, I mean, there, there's nothing that, that prohibits us. I mean, yeah. keep in mind, they could come back with a calendar we don't like. Yeah. And, that, and that has happened, yeah. where the board then imposes a calendar. So we don't want that process. That's why we try to have that flexibility yeah. in developing it. But the, the all calendar option really came out of not having the calendar come forward. And it hasn't happened in a while because usually we're so constrained. But I, I also don't think we shouldn't have, we don't want to be in a situation where we know the community has asked for something and we don't even provide a calendar that has that as an option. So on the first part, I guess you're not really not asking us, I mean, you kind of say that's what you want to continue with. Yes. So that is our recommendation. Right. But certainly, if you would like to change it, I right. mean, we're open to so those I'm, I'm pretty good with those. I did want to just make sure I understand the hurricane makeup dates. I think that flexibility that if we needed to, you know, the event that we're in a, I mean, so far we've been able to with our hours and the flexibility we've had because we normally instruct students longer in a school day that. We have that flexibility. We don't have to make up those days. I'm going to do that. But there are times where we've said, let's say there's a half a day or a professional development day. We're like, we're, going to, we're not going to have those. We're going to eliminate those and go to, to full days of school. But this is saying that in the event that we're out for a lengthy period of time, if you know we had a catastrophic hurricane, we may have to impose that. Maybe have a shortened Christmas break. Maybe not have a Thanksgiving break. But I think, but I would think that'd be catastrophic, and I think that's what it's saying may be effective. But it's giving that flexibility. If we had to do that, we'd have that option. I'm for that. Sometimes our, our hurricane days are excused by the legislature in Tallahassee, and they don't require us to make them up. And that book bites into 180 days, but that's okay. And I, I found the biggest complaint was if we give a full week of Thanksgiving, now <coughs> me, it would be where we make those days up. But I remember in one of the years the teachers were upset because they're planning to go out of town right, that week. And they buy their airplane tickets or they plan their travel. Um, and you know, that's a, that's an argument that we have to I mean, it's a, it's and, and it's still it, not, so. the season's still going on. Hurricane season is, is not open. open. It's, it's not over. Yeah. And, and when we've had storms have been outside or after, Thanksgiving break and said, does that mean we don't do it? And the answer, that's why we put in the language to say it could impact yeah. Christmas. I mean, it could impact something else in our mm -hmm. schedule. And the thing for the parents, notification is that we get the we give them the calendar well in advance of them being able to make airplane reservations for Thanksgiving week. So, yes, are they still going to go? Yeah, they are. I was I was one time. I was teaching when we had a hurricane days to make up. The only people in the school plant were teachers. Kids were all gone with their families and everybody That's came back with a note. So, but we can't do that. But I, I well, and families. I'd too, rather so. I'd rather fit them into the hurricane days in that week than take professional development days away sporadically to make up the days. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we're really we're not able to say.
say that, though. Yeah. I was just going to say, I yeah. think that's really a superintendent's well, decision make, later on. Well, if you need hurricane makeup days, um, on the calendar, uh, on if you don't impose a full one week at Thanksgiving as time off, then you're going to get one calendar, I guarantee you, which is going to show you those three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, are going to be possible hurricane makeup days. But I, I think this statement isn't just about Thanksgiving week. I think it's right. just at the bottom saying that any of those spring break. And you know, when we were on the block schedule, that was more challenging because we we had to end up, you know, the students had that course. They weren't taking another course in January. But now that they're in full year courses, you could probably even extend it into June if we had to, you know, go longer into the school year. We I don't <coughs> want to do that. And that's where this language came in. It came in when we took the language out of the Thanksgiving week. And we said we weren't boxing it in there because the issue became, okay, as soon as we pass the Thanksgiving week, we still will have incidences. Is, is appropriate yeah, that you have, um, and I think that's what staff's recommending. So that stays. Okay. I think that end, you know, the one that we're we're saying to keep on that list also is ending the first the semester uh, before Christmas. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. So all of the items uh, bolded in black would be our non-negotiables in including the end of the semester mm -hmm. one before. And then the instructional staff pre-planning, I think that's one that, that, that the calendar committee can have that conversation about. Um, then, then you're back at the, the aligning the fair you know, spring break. You know, is, is that a non-negotiable any longer? I remember back, and this is back when I was teaching, I think at IPS, 
we didn't have it off, and I remember somehow they ended up making that a half a day so students could at least go in the afternoon. So I think because, you know, again, there's challenges that happen, but we would just need to know that because then they, they could even make that their day, maybe a PD day for the, the teachers. So the students are off, but the staff's at school. But if you want that to be a full day for everybody, I would need to make sure to notate that to Mrs. Krause so she can tell the committee that. But if you're just like, as long as students have the day off, then we can be flexible on whether staff works or not. And is this the year where we do have the fair dates? The, yeah, we know when they are. We go through a, March 20th. Because this one we, ha we know. Right. Mr. Month. Porter had to make um, an agreement with the Midway company, and so I think he did a three or four year, I'm not sure, the length of time. Yeah. So he now knows the next few years oh. when the fair is. You know, last year we were in a little bit of a concern of not knowing until late. We didn't yes. have the date, so that's where we had a little well, bit of an issue. That was because the concessionaires had not yes. talked to Mr. Porter, so he didn't know exactly yes. when he could. Yes. It was not anything that... It was, he was trying to get yeah, the information, get we just it. didn't have it. He didn't have it. But we do know it. Right now we know. Mrs. So Krause said she can designate, she knows that. that. Um, if you wanted that as a non-goers, non-goers for state That's a good idea down to Friday being a student day off and potentially a professional development day. That, I mean, that was one of the things that was talked about, adding that to a non-negotiable, which I, I could see that, and you know, it would be interesting to see. Well, let me just add that we have to count At least, least we we have one day and then the potential of a professional development that could be used and be flexed and out. And that would happen if, because we have to not only count the student 180 days, but we also have to count the hours that we're giving them professional development. So it depends if, if in that particular quarter we had enough professional development to fit in, we wouldn't have to require it. But if we could, we could use that if we needed those hours for the teachers. But I don't think it's, it's a winning situation. We have the Friday for the students to designation of oh, one year we had Monday and Tuesday when the students really couldn't go. They were off, but they couldn't go because it wasn't going to happen. But just to have Friday to know that you can go is a good idea. I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm good with that. <laughs> so let me understand. So I heard fair day on Friday, but certainly a calendar committee could make the whole fair week off yeah. if they want yes. to choose. Yes. They can yes. choose that. Yes. But the yes. only non-negotiable is Every calendar will definitely have off the Friday of fair week. So for students. For students. Right. And if the calendar committee wants to make it a full day for staff, that's up to them. And that's not going to be a problem with last calendar. I think we gave three Fridays in a row when we didn't know when the fair was going to be. Right. So, so we had three Fridays in a row off. <laughs> and the only thing that I would ask, and I, th I think it's it's standard operating at this point, but again, when we do get the votes back, SAC. I would like to see um, all of the SAC votes because, unfortunately, they only get one vote. So they're the equivalent of one individual person at a school. But, but yet they're, what they're thinking is a collective body. And I think it's helpful for us to see that um, and, and what they're thinking. A lot of times they do go along with staff. But I think it's it's. You're it's asking helpful. you want to see that. You're asking Mrs. Crowder provide that in the presentation. Or yeah, and and she's done that in the past, where where there's the staff votes, and then there's also the SAC votes, because when you do all of the the calendar committee votes, a SAC vote is the equivalent of one person, and and really then, I means just one other person could override the entire SAC body, so it, it helps to be able to see what the SAC um, thinks as a collective. Enough? Uh, so let me just clarify. I have one <laughs> black, and then I also have semester <laughs> one before Christmas you want to end, and then yes. we talked about the fair day, which I, I think I've encompassed that. That's, that's it? Okay. The seven days instructional staff pre planning is not the. Uh, no, they, they might include that as one. It could be five, it could be you know whatever the committee, but there'll probably be multiple options because the committee, as Ms. Counts knows, they're the groups meet and they determine a variety of options. Yeah. And we try to give you three different calendars. Okay. And the teachers. Three I will share this with Ms. Crowell. Thank okay. you all very much. All right. It is now 5 o'clock. Thank you, board members. <coughs> oh. It's time. <laughs> it's past time. Don't speak.
change it. <laughs> Merging one's going to expire. So, uh, the, to approve the face, the, uh, face cover. Okay. 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 I'm here for any questions that you may have. Yes, we, we've handled this before, so it's... Yes, we, you approved for advertising uh, not at the last meeting, maybe at the last meeting. Anyhow, 20, at least 28 days ago, and so it's here for a final approval to turn the emergency policy over into the a permanent policy. You can always repeal that at any point in time when all this mess goes away. It would avoid us having to come back every. Yeah, you can't do that. So, so. It moves to approve the uh, policy 3.232 phase cut. Second. I have a motion by the. Mrs. Powers, uh, second by Mrs. Bryan, to approve and adopt policy 3.232, base coverings. All those in favor? You gotta ask for public input, please. Public input. Three times? Mm -hmm. Any public input on base coverings? Any public input on base coverings? We're probably the only meeting in the world that's not getting any comments on base coverings. Well, it was written well. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice in 3B, I did put three kindergarten yes. members. So. Sorry. Others in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 4 0. And the next thing we have in public hearing is the code of conduct. I'll do it. Okay. So. Y'all approved it for advertising. It's the final code of conduct for the 2021 school year, I think. That's where we're going to have our meeting coming up this week on the new one. And so it's here for approval by the board. The 2021 code of student conduct. I just have one question. On page 14, we have that list of threats that ends with bomb threat. And I think we discussed, especially after the verbal threat that we had with um, Kimberly's primary um, a year and a half ago, that we were going to try and add another type of threat to it, but I can't remember the conversation. Um, we could have that conversation Thursday. We have the code of conduct meeting. Yeah, so. um, it's just something that, that, you know, that we have with our, our school violence um, and the kids that are threatening. Yeah, I'll make a note of it and we yeah. can talk about it. Traces so darn quick. Now we haven't had one of those in years. Thank goodness. Yeah. So now we need to trap and trace that's, these that, stuff. That's by statute. Yeah. So by statute, it's the uh, automatic. But I'd like to see. I'd like to see it at least put out there in some kind of voice that we, you know, you don't have to see it in writing. If they say something that they're going to come into a school and, and try to harm our faculty or kids. Um, well, you can make a bomb threat verbally, and that'll still get you in trouble. They may not yeah. arrest them for it, but it's still a violation of the code. I'd like to see that threat address what we're really dealing with with okay. these uh, violent people. You're still on the code of conduct committee, correct, Ms. Kelly? No, I substituted one time oh. for Mr. Dodge. Yeah, well, that's fine. That's fine. We'll <laughs> make a note. It caused a little trouble then. Yeah, that's fine. Do you want okay. me to be on it again? Can, can, can two of us sit? No, ma'am. No. <laughs> Unless Mr. Dodge would like to the seat and miss me. <laughs> so, but we'll, uh, we'll make a note of it and, and okay. address it and for next year's code. Yeah, I just I just want to yes, tighten it up as much as possible. Any other questions about the code of conduct? Public input. I think it has to be moved to approve first. Oh, okay. I move approval. Second. Okay. 
I have a motion by Mrs. Fry, a second by Mrs. Powers to approve the amended 2020-2021 Code of Student Conduct. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Oh, three times, excuse me, two more times. Any, any further comment? We're storming the podium. That's good. <laughs> any other comment on the Student Code of Conduct? Any other comment for the last call for comment on this student code of conduct? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Recess the public hearing. Recess the public hearing. And we are now going to open up the public hearing. Reopen the regular. Dixon, wait until 5.30? You have to. It's advertised for 5.30. Okay. All right. So we'll reopen the regular meeting. And next on our agenda is Mrs. Swain. Good afternoon. I ask the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the Golden Rod. I'll make a motion to approve the instructional support recommendations as listed on the Golden Rod. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Dodd, a second by Mrs. Bryant to approve the personnel and, and uh, support uh, personnel as the presented on the Golden Rod. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I ask the board's approval for Mr. Dave Vincent to be named as district police chief with an effective date of November 2nd, 2020. I need to approve Dave Vincent to the appointment to the school district safety chief. District police chief. Yes. He is well. We'll have we'll have two. We'll have, we'll two. have two named district police chief. Yes. Okay, I'm so confused. Okay. Yes. Until what, December twenty second. <laughs> I don't know who's happier. <laughs> <laughs> Says, is that legally we can have two chiefs? Is that right, Mr. Bradshaw? As far as can we have two police chiefs? Per our per our school board. Yeah. So for the school board, you can have whatever you want to name your positions. You can name them. For FDLE, he will have a different title through November second until I leave, and or he has the official sworn title through the state. But the school can name positions however they want to name So he, I will swear him in when he first starts working as an employee of the police department. And then at the transition ceremony, which I'm right now going to guess it's going to be the December 8th meeting, whatever that last board meeting is, will be the, the, where the board would actually swear him in at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, But there's not a title in the school board's position control uh, for anything other than police chief. So that's that's his title within the school board's personnel section. So we're gonna, his title is going to be police chief only with us, not with FDLE. At this, or, at so, this time. But to make it kind okay. of easy, we'll, we'll probably name him like the deputy chief. So he'll still go by chief, and which is what a deputy chief goes by. And so his shirt and everything will still be the same and be under control that way. Okay.
we would like to congratulate you and welcome you to Citrus County School. Did you want to say anything? Yeah. Okay. Well, oh no, I told you there was going to be a five-minute speech. <laughs> hey, we'll get used to getting called to the podium just out of room, so we'll just we'll take it in December. But that's never made us repeat pieces straight, so anytime you just like Um, next on our agenda is Attorney Legal Matters. No. No. Florida School Safety Assessment Tool. Oh, Florida Safety School Assessment Tool. Good evening. So this will be the third year that the annual findings and recommendations for the Florida State School Assessment Tool has been presented to the board. Uh, Sherry did it two years ago. I did it last year, uh, doing it again this year. If you'll remember, the Florida State School Assessment Tool is uh, exempt from public record. It's confidential. You're not allowed to release the information within that report in part or in whole uh, to the public whatsoever. However, at the same time, they require presentation to you guys, uh, the board, so it's kept at a fairly high level. We don't get into specifics, we don't get into security information about specific schools um, because of the confidential nature of what's in that report. Uh, so data sources that we went through, of course, is the review of the dis district best practices assessment uh, from last year, uh, a review of Senate Bill 726 and 730 for compliance and policy changes. Uh, a review of the 18 and 19 and 19 and 20 targeting grants um, and in progress security changes that are going on now, uh, and then completion of the 2021 school risk assessment campus tour with leadership from each school's input from the director of facilities, transportation, code compliance, and then a review of uh, Florida DOE letters providing recommendations on school security procedures. Uh, and so, with that, the recommendations for this year uh, is we need to Further control visitor access to the remaining schools to better secure uh, employ our school entryways. We have a couple schools that are still uh, not as secure as we would like at, the, at their entryways. Um, add additional electronic clocks as funding allows. I know two years ago I submitted for a federal grant to push that along. Those are very expensive. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get that grant, but as funding either through the Harding grant or other sources become available, we are going to pursue those vigorously, um, because last year we did do the MOU with other first responding agencies uh, to give them access through those electronic clocks. We want to strengthen our reunification policies and procedures. Um, we want to continue with mass communication systems like we did at the high schools uh, under the previous Harvard grant for our middle schools. And we want to continue our partnership and continue to build out our rapid emergency management system uh, which has an accountability and a reunification and an alert app. Uh, as part of that system, and that alert app will make sure that we are in compliance with Alyssa's law. And then continue enhancement of our exterior school hardening as needed, uh, fencing, impact film, and cameras. Uh, we have multiple schools that are still in need of some additional fencing uh, that either they don't have it or they don't, or they, it needs to be completed uh, from its current you know, perspective. And then. Even with some of the schools that were adding more restrictive entries, you know, the, the three schools that we're just finishing up, um, you know, looking at going ahead and adding impact film to those new entryways uh, as part of that hardening process. So all of those things are, are part of that recommendation uh, for this year's FSSAT. Do you have any questions? Yes, I, um, let me hand on your slide. I come before.
for you just asking for your consideration on um, your usage of Title IV-A funding. Um, in a recent article that I read, North Carolina schools are using Title IV-A funding for all the arts teachers. So I'm representing all the arts drama uh, teachers in the county, um, of which there are, I'm thinking, probably close to 45. Uh, at least 20 of them, when I put this out to them on what their thoughts were, they responded to me that, that I should, um, that this is something that would be a tremendous help to our all of our arts programs with all the schools, elementary through high school. And this Title IV-A, my understanding, and, I, and, and um, Mrs. Kaler sent me a very nice email on how it's being used now, and it's outstanding how it's being used, and it has to be. My understanding it's used for all the, the teachers that see all the students in the school. And as arts teachers, we do. Um, elementary, definitely. Uh, it goes also with PE, so you've got PE, arts, um, drama, and, it, and at the high school level, I know it's, it's, you have to have a credit, so we see them as well. So all the students in, this, in the school need an arts credit. And so what I'm asking is, uh, there's $340,000 of comes from the state for Title IV-A, and I'd like to ask for 10%, but I know that's a lot, maybe $34,000, but so I'm, I'm asking for your consideration to, to think about at least 5% for us, uh, f for our programs. I know at the high school I get $500 a year. The elementary school we used to get like a dollar a student, which was nice. But at the high school I get $500 and immediately in August I lose 240 of that for Florida School Music Association dues. And then at our school we have a senior awards night and they set aside another $200 for our award. So I'm left with less than $100 to run my program every year. And then you think, well, you can raise money through your programs. Well, I have, I have every year, I have parents that come up to me and say, why do you charge for your programs? They should be free. And I think, well, we have music to buy, we have instruments to buy, we have things that it costs money to run our program, and it doesn't come out of the air. And I, I'm thinking they think that the school board gives us plenty of money to run our programs, and that's just not the case. And it breaks my heart when I have kids after the concert, and they say, well, my parents couldn't afford to come. And I've told them, I don't ever turn people away. If they don't have money, we'll figure it out. It's a donation. But a lot of them don't take that to heart. They think, well, i got to pay my $5 to get into the concert. So I'm just asking you for your consideration of this is a funding source to help our school programs, our, all of our arts programs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Chief Grant? I think Mr. Dodd has the first question. So, uh, as a board, we have some responsibility uh, over the recommendations of the Florida State School Assessment Tools, and uh, those tools are quite lengthy now, aren't they? Uh, but can you just talk a little bit about the tool real quick, and then um, i got a couple of points in there. Sure. So, the tool is now uh, 458 questions um, for each school. So. Every one of the schools, we have to go through and answer all, you know, 428 questions. Uh, it takes a team to do it. It really does. You have to have input from facilities. You have to have input from transportation. Uh, and then sitting down and going through this year with uh, the leadership team from each school, uh, putting it up on, on a board and, and going through it question by question. It, it, it's a very lengthy process, but, you know, uh, it's very important that the principal uh, and the APs know firsthand everything that's being put onto that document. Um, and so they sit right there with me as we fill these things out. Um, and it, it's pretty comprehensive. It covers pretty much everything we do uh, security-wise at, at the district level. And so, I mean, accountability is pretty strong, like, um, like Chief Grant said. I mean, the team, the principals uh, are very much aware of the issues it's not just a check the box type form. There's discussion, there's a lot of people that are 
involved with Florida State School as a tool, which helps provide you know, student safety and staff safety. So it's an involved process. We've done a, a very good job at making sure that things don't fall between the cracks. And that's the purpose of the extended FSSAT, to make sure we're looking at everything and all possible situations. And there's training components, and there's all the hardening side of this that's so important. Um, and so as we look at that, those tools, that they're confidential, by the way, uh, Buddy said. They're confidential. Now, that's to the public. They're not confidential, but that's important. SSAT um, can, you know, and, and Buddy's job or the job is to bring to the board the recommendations. So if you would just talk a little bit about that, because all we really get to see before the public is this broad brush painted picture. Mm -hmm. And so can you just kind of talk about that a little bit about, I mean, how you came up with these recommendations to us? Yeah, so these are recommendations that are items that we can look at looking at it again from a district perspective you know drilling down into a school by school perspective um, has a lot more detail obviously in the FSSATs and if you have any questions about any particular school by all means let me know but these are kind of the overriding uh, issues that we see at most all schools the recommendations that I have here every school in the district would benefit from additional electronic locks additional camera systems, additional fencing. You know, these are our broad stroke, district-wide uh, recommendations. You know, we do a great job on our training. Uh, you don't see additional training like for ALICE. We just received for the third year in a row our ALICE certification. You're an ALICE certified organization. We trained over 2,700 people last year. We're well over 25, almost 2,600 this year so far. Um, you know, and our training is, is very robust. And we have employees that are in their third year of their ALICE training. Um, all the guardians are ALICE certified instructors. And I make them available to the school admin anytime they need it. Whenever new teachers are hired in a the school, they're part of their job, whether it's a school that they spend a lot of time at or just a, a secondary school that they spend less time at, they get with those staff members and after they finish their ALICE training and make sure they're comfortable with the ALICE protocols and what they're supposed to do. Um, things that we have in place, like our school safety plan, like our white red folders, or, you know, our emergency procedures guides. Uh, I have shared that with uh, our classroom assessments with at least 15 districts across the state. Um, I just had a district uh, reach out to me that asked for one about a week ago. Our regional person has visited our schools and uh, has been very impressed with everything we do here. So she uses us as a model for different things across the state, so I get these uh, requests. Hey, can I get a copy of this? Can I get a copy of that? So today it was interesting. Um, I had a school reach back out to me and say, that is exactly what we're looking for, your red web folder. Matter of fact, we want to use the same printer you guys used. Who'd you get a printer at? You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, there, there are things like that, but really this covers some physical hardening issues. And, you know, all of these things get uh, prioritized based on funding, you know, where, how are we going to pay for some of these different things. The hardening grant, as we uh, did last year, we put that money towards hardening the entryways of some of our schools. Uh, this coming year, that's our goal again, is to take that hardening money and further harden the entryways of a couple schools that really need it. You know, where you get buzzed in that front door, but it's you're not immediately pushed into an office space where you're confronting a person. There's you're, you have access to the school between coming through that front door and, and going to that office, and we, we need to correct those. And, um, but those are expensive moves. You know, we're talking about totally redoing entryways of schools. And so we have done that for uh, three schools. We have done it for three. Are, are almost complete. Almost complete. They look wonderful. Yes, and so. Uh, the, the parents of those schools obviously know that there's been some changes that have gone on there, and uh, that's all in the name of safety, and uh, we have more work to be done. Like we said, it costs money, but the bottom line is you, as the school safety specialist, now have to approve all those individual school FSSATs, mm -hmm. correct? And it's reported to the superintendent, and we have the district mm -hmm. um, 
the district assessment, which is kind of what we have here with these recommendations, broad brush, but we can have access to the specifics. Mm -hmm. And if we need to talk about the specifics, which I would like to do, although I would say I don't, I don't need to do it now, but I have some specifics that I would like to go into a closed session on, probably according to Mr. Bradshaw, and I would like to say that we would do that at our workshop meeting because I do have some, some pointed direct questions that I can mention now in, in the public, but I would assume Mr. Bradshaw might say you can't talk about that. So, um, you know, but there are issues ahead with Alyssa's Law. You talked about Raptor, you have it on here. You know, the DOE's um, recommendation too is how we better communicate with parents in the local community. I know you have some, some things on here with communication. Um, but also, you know, our computer, our issues with securely, and some of those things that we have before us that we need to, to make sure the board is aware of as we as technology advances and as we realize what we have to do to protect students. And we talked a little bit about this in the safety and security committee sure. meeting, which is interesting, and I think would be advantageous to the board to hear that discussion. So, um, uh, Madam Chair, I would I would like to. Um, I would like to request a, a closed session meeting on school safety at the, at the workshop. Yes. Why are the middle schools um, singled out in number four on the recommendations for communication? Because um, we did it at the high schools for what we call mass communication, and at the high schools, the, the big speakers that yes. we added that can broadcast across all the way out to like the ag buildings. Yeah, and you have that really that same situation set up at our middle schools because of when you look at um, Emerson's Middle School or Citrus Springs Middle School and how far out some of those students are taking the ad classes or are some of the far PE courses, that would just be the next iteration of continuing on with that process to make sure that they're they're able to get and receive any alert okay. out that far. And then after that would be elementary schools. We have some elementary schools that it's a very extensive campus. It's a long way to the back of PG's, you know, playground or Hernando's playground and, you know, Rock Crusher and where they want to spend some of their time. So. Fletcher and, and Kathy Androwski. Uh, I do talk to them, you know, as we know, we've, we've had some concerns in the past, and mm -hmm. uh, as Mr. Dottie alluded to, we talked about some things the other day with Securely and, and what, you know, that brings forward. So um, that was a, a big topic of safety and security the other day. So there are some things in place to keep an eye on and monitor what the activity of our kids and our students and as they're out there with all the devices that are available right now with virtual learning. Uh, we, we keep a pretty close eye on that and have a team from each school that have been identified that as keywords pop up in searches or things like that that are immediately alerted and notified so they can take action. And I'm going to save you a lot of reading because we just on the consent agenda approved 22 SAC school improvement plans. And if you look, there's a questionnaire that says, where do you feel the safest? And the multiple choice answer for all of my schools at least and most of the others in their classrooms. Okay. So thank you for what you do. Thank you. And you kind of keep doing it. That's nice to hear that the kids feel safe in their classrooms. Yes, yes it is very nice. Thank you.
to recess the regular meeting, and we are going to open up a 5.30 public hearing. Reopen the public hearing. Reopen the public hearing. That's right, we combined it. Made motion made mention of it earlier with full city elementary and with the kitchen project and the new class uh, classroom wing. I'm very excited that that continues to stay on our five year our plan. And now I see where um, the kitchen remodel now is scheduled for 22-23. Is that right? Um, yes, sir. Um, so we're going to start with that kitchen remodel, but obviously that's in line with the expansion of the classroom wing too, correct? Yes, it is. They're broken out into four separate projects being expansion and remodel for both classroom and the cafeteria. And part of that is because of funding, how they're funded. And right. also we'll probably, uh, as they get closer, there may be some other uh, changes in phasing as we develop the plans for uh, construction, but as it stands now, they've been moved from the 10-year plan to the 5-year plan. Right, and they continue to stay on the same schedule uh, yes. that we had last year, right? And so some of those are impacting fundable? Yes, the expansion part will be. Yes. So that's why they're broken out into separate. So good news, we'll continue to move forward with that, and uh, you know, I don't want to lose sight of that. I mean, a couple years away, um, but I'm glad it's continues to stay in the park. Sorry. No and, and Mr. Guy, you should be able to cut the ribbon. <laughs> Is there anything else on the five-year work plan that Mr. Dixon can answer for you? Now we'll entertain a motion to approve and adopt. motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. I move to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. I second the motion. I have a motion by Mrs. Powers, a second by uh, Mrs. Bryant, to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. Is there any discussion for the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2020-2021 fiscal year, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0. Thank you, and I did want to mention we are going to be bringing the impact fee report to you on December 8th okay. for a Zoom presentation and a final a review. And uh, Mr. Dixon, since, well, I, actually, I, I, I'm going to public here, so I'll, I'll wait till later. Sorry. Any other information? We're going to close the public hearing, and we're going to reopen the regular school board meeting.
conduct meeting is this week. Is there anything that the board wants me to bring up to the uh, the meeting? It's going to be a Zoom meeting, but that's this scheduled for Thursday. I've got time. Yes. <laughs> anything else? Okay. Um, St. Front Schools, our sidewalk project, Mr. Dixon is moving right ahead. So excited to see that on 581. I know Ms. Power sees it probably every day she leaves her house. And, uh, you know, that's a great program that we have um, that's going to, especially for, you know, students at Pleasant Grove Elementary and St. Front School that they'll have that sidewalk. And um, I was just going to ask Mr. Dixon the status of that project, if you knew it, and also the Beverly Hills project. It's being managed by the Department of Transportation, District 7. The one in Beverly Hills, they ran into a little bit of a snag with a rolling oaks, rolling oaks utility, a water line in the right of way that was you know, very costly to remove, so they're still trying to find funding to start that project. And that's not looking good. It's looking like it's going to get delayed a while. So The extra funding you're seeing for the Rolling Hills for the work that had to be done? The relocation of the utility line. In the same uh, right of way as the sidewalk. I hope we can still push for that. Yes. Um, and, uh, but that's kind of a really neat project, and, and I know Buster Tom's, Buster's here from the Chronicle, but you know, if you look at the work that went into even this Pleasant Road Elementary project, the, the time that it took to get where we are today, the funding, the coordinated the work of uh, the school district, Mr. Dixon, the work of the Department of Transportation, the and city of Inverness. Well, the, the county. The did. county. Um, you know, and didn't the engineer most of the pre-engineering and a lot of the legwork for that project, mm -hmm. all of those projects. I want to ask a question about the bus stop. It doesn't stop at the uh, what, preschool. Yes. And where, will the bus still be stopping there, or will it stop over at the sidewalk? Uh, that I don't have an answer for you right yeah, now. It's power. The sidewalk's on the other side of the road, though, okay. so. It always has been a little bit of an issue there, and we have to talk to them about it, but I uh, don't really have it. I might I'll check on it for you. Also, uh, I noticed on Bay News 9 today, Mr. Gagne, the geometry teacher at Citrus I, was the A-plus teacher. We also had a teacher at Academy of Environmental Science, um, Ms. Healy, that was uh, was recognized. It's really neat to see that, and uh, so um, um, it's great to highlight the hard work of our teachers, and that's being done. Um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so I'm wearing my pink tie for that. Um, if you want to know why the pink today, but I did have a, a, an item of discussion. I talked to Dr. Heber a little bit about uh, dealing with uh, our clubs and extracurricular activities, and uh, I've talked to Mr. Nolan, I've talked to the superintendent too, and I know there's a plan they're working on, and I, we've been getting a lot of uh, parent interest and students that are interested to get back going with uh, with clubs and uh, you know with band and certain things that can be allowed so I just wanted to make sure uh, that we're on track I know there was a nine week we're looking at this nine week point but that we're going to be uh, moving forward uh, with those opportunities so uh, the question I guess for you Mr. Heber is could you tell us a little bit about how that looks going forward for us Yes, we, the executive team has been reviewing, and you know our school reopening plan that we have um, adopted has been reviewing the end of the nine weeks to determine what things we would keep in place or what changes we would make. So currently I'm going to kind of list out to you what are those recommendations that we have, and then um, if you have any other input that you want us to consider, certainly the executive team can review that and make those determinations. So first of all, um, tutoring at the schools. Um, we, we've said that if they're doing it in-house and they have their own staff, they can do it before school, after school. Um, there were questions about offering tutoring for the students as long as it's with their own staff. We're not bringing in outside um, you know, folks to come in and tutor, but if it's your own staff, they can certainly do that. Fundraisers, we've said um, administrators may consider having students at the school participate in fundraisers. 
but we're encouraging the use of like a virtual model. We know that many companies offer opportunities for students to sell items, and we're asking to do it more virtually, and that we're saying we don't want students selling items door to door. We just don't, um, trying to, to lessen that exchange of, of materials. Clubs, um, administrators may allow schools to have clubs meet after school if they follow the district protocols in the Citrus Cares reopening plan. Some have asked if they have guest speakers. I said if guest speakers are gonna come, they need to do it via Zoom. So if I'm the agriculture club at a particular high school and I want someone to speak to my students, I would then schedule them to come at that time and they would Zoom into the class, we'd show them on a projector and they could certainly participate in that. Um, but not having extra folks come onto the campus. School pictures. Um, we said school administrators can begin to make the decision to allow for individual school pictures. Um, schools can schedule group pictures um, with parent permission. Um, we're saying the photographer must abide by all the protocols in the re reopening plan, but students must opt in to participate in those school pictures. So we know that we have various sporting groups that want to do group pictures. As long as they follow the protocols, they have their mask on, and then when they're ready to take the picture, the kids take the mask off, they take the picture. As soon as the picture is done, they put the mask back on and they, they walk away. So just following the same safety protocols we have in place, but they can still do a group picture where students are together. So the, the next thing was we had questions on chorus, band, and drama productions. Um, at this time, we're recommending outside, um, if they want to do an outside concert, but we know that um, as we come upon some of the seasons where outside might not be conducive. Mrs. Woyfaler is setting up a meeting with all the fine art teachers to review kind of what they could do, come up with a proposal, and present that to the executive team of how that might look. We've had some conversation with Mr. Kuhnel at Cantle High School about possibly having Curtis Peterson um, be used for any of the schools that want to use that, because again, we have to follow our protocols of social distancing and the cleaning procedures that have to be in place. But Ms. Woyfaler, I know, is meeting um, with them, I believe, on Monday um, to discuss that, and then we'll be able to get their recommendations of what they would like to see and how we can make that happen. Because, you know, we want to hear from the teachers, like Mr. Garlock at the school, what do they think might work, what would be best um, that we can do that so we can accommodate their, their needs as well. And then I know there were questions about volunteers and mentors, and we are going to continue with the suspension of all school-based non-essential visitors from entering the school campus during school hours. So the, the, the changes that I mentioned, um, that is, you know, that's not a change, but I just wanted that lifted out so you were aware. Um, we're still not having volunteers or mentors or, or other non-essential visitors in the building at this time. And when was this going to take place as far as uh, the clubs and that? that, that? They, we have been talking about starting to open those back up and having those communications. Um, my plan is after the board meeting today, I'm going to send this out to the principals and tell them they can begin to start planning for that as we're, you know, we're within a, a week or two of the nine weeks ended, so we're going to give them that option to begin to start doing that at this time. Great. So we're really pretty much, I mean, our plan along was to pause this first nine weeks and yes. we're going to be ready to get started immediately, uh, maybe With, even before depending on how this goes, right. but, uh, so that the message for our students and parents would be, right. you know, this is what's going to take place as far as allowing extracurricular activities. And, and it's, right, and as we're monitoring the situation, I know the executive team, there could be more things, you know, in a month we could come back to you and say, we'd like to make some additional recommendations. We've looked at the plan, we'd like to make continued recommendations, but at this time we'd like to leave what's in the plan with these additional pieces I shared with you until the, the, the holiday time in December, the Christmas break. And then at that time, then we'll make those recommend, additional recommendations possible. And also with the understanding that if things don't go well, we have to shut things down, and that's gonna take place. Those, that, that could be a recommendation as well. Right. You know, our hope is I'm, you know, in the positive mode of being proactive, that if, if things start to look better, and we feel that it's, it's in our best interest to open those things back up, um, we will do that. But a, as you know, we're, we want to be very cautious in our work and cautious, um, you know, our safety of our students and our staff. So that is why we're not, um, we don't want to just open everything back up and say, you know, we're back to normal at this point. So for instance, safety patrol in the elementary schools, mm -hmm. how is that going to look? So if the, the, 
principals would allow them to be able to meet, would allow the fundraising that they to take place for us. I have heard, you know, how that's looking right now for a safe patrol trip this next summer. I have no idea, but I, I know the safe patrols haven't been able to do much right now. But just as an example, that's going to open the door yeah. for this, correct? They, yes, they just need to be thinking about what kind of fundraisers they're doing. So, you know, again, we're, we're not wanting students to be out selling things, collecting money, having to turn those things in at this point. So anything that they can use where they're using a virtual model. If you think about the hometown ticketing that we use for our sporting events, there's no money that exchanges hands. You simply go online and, and you do it electronically. So we're asking the schools to work with some of those companies that provide fundraising to look at those virtual models so the students still can do the fundraising, but they're not having to necessarily hand something off to somebody to get the, the item and have an exchange of, of cash. It's done through an electronic means. It's what we're recommending. Okay. And then for the bands, um, you know, I know the halftime shows have been reduced time-wise, but if uh, our schools, I've been to some football games as far as, you know, the bands are seated um, in the end zone at Citrus and, you know, they play in the stands, which is great, but if if a principal were to work that out for the band to be able to take the field, maybe not do an entire show, but that's going to open the door for that as well. That could open the door. I just know, I, I will tell you, being a former band member and a parent of several students that went through the system in band, I don't know how they would do that because you start that over the summer. Like it's a lot of time and energy you put in to preparing for even just a march on the field, that practice. And I don't know if they've had any of those opportunities. So. I, I don't know, I'd have to, I know Mrs. Voigtheiter was meeting with those folks, so they could have that conversation if they felt they wanted to explore some of those options. And then what about the balls at recess? And uh, are we going to be able to open the door on that as far as... I've asked Ms. Taylor, because she's been working with our elementary um, principals, if she could speak to that for you. Good evening. Yes, we have spoken with the elementary principals, and I am on an email thread with, with all of our elementary PE teachers. And some schools have already started working on a process to disinfect the balls and or equipment. It just depends on, A, how many minutes are in between each class period. Do they have the resources, personnel-wise, to disinfect all the items? But the standard for disinfecting, is that going to change maybe as well? I mean, this 15-minute rule, I mean, I guess, I don't know if you can explain to me where that came from. I don't know where it came from. I mean, I think I do, but where did the 15-minute rule for cleaning balls come from? Well, it depends on what you're using as a disinfectant. We do have the spray that you can only have to have it sit for a minute. So... I, the 15 minute rule depends on what they're utilizing, what their process is. Okay. Well, I'm glad that we're working towards that. I, I think the kids oh, I totally agree. Okay. Um, and then winter sports were on, were a go for the timeline, the FHSAA calendar for winter sports has not changed. So, yes, uh, that, that is continuing. I spoke to uh, Mr. Bishop, and that is continuing to move forward. Um, you know, at this point, now I say that at this point, as you know, it's ever changing. Um, the plan is to move forward with that. So that is my understanding. So our coaches, our students, the principals get the word out for these. these my understanding is that they're, that's all, they're going to follow the same calendar. That, that's not been delayed, because you know our other calendar was delayed. That calendar, my understanding, is not delayed. Okay, great. And then the capacity at sporting events, I know, and we had discussed, I know that Mr. Bishop, we had talked a little bit about, you know, upping that. Uh, do you know any ideas, like, are we going to be able to move to a 33% or 50% capacity? My understanding was it did move up to 33% recently. It's up to 35 35% now. So I know they're monitoring that at each event and making those determinations, whether or not to do that or not. So, but I know it's looking favorable. People are doing what they need to do, so I think they're able to make those. Excellent. That's great news. Thank you. So that's all I have, Ms. Counts. Would you like, would you like a, another update at the workshop? Can we do it two weeks so that we can see if anything is going to change in the next nine weeks? Do we need to know anything? I, I certainly can do that. Um, I don't know if anything else will change, yeah. but certainly if you
you'd like, I can certainly be prepared to come. And if there isn't any changes, I can say there aren't any changes. Um, but I know these we're going to get out as soon as possible tomorrow so the staff is aware. Scott, we at least have day one of the fine arts. So. Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll know the, about the fine arts and, and those decisions. So. John, I'm Yes, ma'am. Thanks. a lot of Zoom meetings um, for Zoom SAECs, and I'm getting ready to do another visit Zoom on Thursday. I'm Zooming away. I hope so. I hope you usually bring us money. I'm working on that. <laughs> I, and I really don't have anything except I've also been attending those Zoom meetings, and I was glad that I, I, I saw Plural City and their cafeteria and their, their kitchen area moving up on the, the calendar a little bit. Um, I had the opportunity, because I consider myself not essential, so I've been to a lot of schools since um, they opened. Figured they had enough problems besides entertaining me. But um, I had an occasion to go to the Canto uh, Middle School um, last Wednesday and Thursday. And if you haven't been in the roundabout, it is working. It is popular. Looking forward to more Zoom meetings, but absolutely looking forward to getting this thing over with. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for your leadership as the chair and for the work that Ms. Powers did on the legislative um, proposals. Um, you know, I'm, I'm passionate like you are on, the, on your message there, so thank you for putting that down in writing and getting that out there, and I hope that SBA will, um, will adopt that. Yes, yes. There being no further business to come before the board.